we are now going to examine the wonderful holiday known as Christmas. Now what could be possibly wrong with having the spirit of goodwill towards men and all this? Well, if you understand the truth behind the Christmas story, you're going to find out that the whole thing is wrong. When I was a child, I remember when my father used to take us out to the woods and we would take an axe, we would find a nice full pine tree and we would cut it down, we would drag it through the snow, we would bring it in the house, much to my mother's protest because there'd be pine needles and snow everywhere. And then we would set it up on one of those metal stands so that it wouldn't move, you know, we made sure it was really good and solid. And we would um, deck it with gold and silver trimmings and everything. And of course, you know, put the traditional five-pointed sow on top of it. And this is what most people, if they're from my generation, and most people nowadays, um, would have gone through that. I'm not saying that you will go out and cut down a tree. No, most, a lot of people like going for the artificial stuff. So what could possibly be wrong with a Christmas tree? Is there anything unbiblical or ungodly about it? Well, according to the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 10, we pick it up in verse 1. It says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, and folks, I want you to memorize these next seven words. Learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. Now listen very carefully to this one, the middle of verse 3. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a Christmas tree. And right here, in God's own word, he says, learn not the way of the heathen. When the heathen are the ancient occultists, they're also known as pagans. You are not supposed to be practicing any of this. God's own word makes it very clear not to be involved in this. And yet, there are going to be those people who's going to try to convince you, well, God's not talking about a tree here. He was referring to a plant or to something else. I've heard these arguments over and over and over again, ladies and gentlemen, and quite honestly, at this age, I'm sick of it. Because God's word makes it very clear. These people have gone out, they've cut down a tree, they brought it home, they fastened it so it didn't move, they put all types of gold and silver decorations on it. They deck the halls with it. And this is exactly what we're doing to this very day. So don't tell me that this is something other than a tree. Because this is exactly what those pagans were doing then, and that's exactly what we're doing now. And when we take a look just at one of these pictures, this is exactly what the Bible had been talking about. People had been trimming it and decking it with gold and silver and all these wonderful, beautiful items that I wanted. The um, pagans, among other things, they would um, put little um, pieces of cake, candy, and sweet items on it. This is why to this very day we're putting um, candy canes and other things like that on it because it's part of the ancient pagan practice of honoring the winter stag god. Now, as I just stated, Jeremiah makes it very, very clear that Christmas trees are not supposed to be observed. They have absolutely nothing to do with anything that is good or godly. So then the question is, why are we doing it? On top of the Christmas tree, and just about most Christmas trees, you will find that there is a five-pointed star. Now the question is, why do we have, you know, such an item on top of our trees? If you recall, well, there's many different candies, little cakes and offerings and such here. All this is here because it goes all the way back to Nimrod. Nimrod himself, 
as depicted here, this is one of the ancient depictations on a relief of Nimrod. Nimrod himself, if you remember, was the stag god. He was considered the winter god. And just like at um, Rockefeller Center, where they have these huge Christmas trees every year all lit up, at the top you'll find the traditional five-pointed star. Now, interesting enough, at the base, in front of Rockefeller Center, whose address is 666, mind you, and it's no accident because if you've ever gone to that building, and I've seen it and been there before, the very top, these huge neon lights, there were three red sixes that will glow at night. But at the base of this um, tree is a statue, and that remains there all year. And let me show you a larger version of this. That statue is um, the statue of Prometheus. Now, Prometheus, if you know your ancient um, Greek legends, was the one who stole the fire of illumination from the gods and brought it down to mankind. So mankind now had um, illumination or, or the enlightenment of wisdom. He stole the fire from the gods. So, why are there, among other things, Christmas lights on the tree? Well, you see, there's a lot of history behind this. You see, in the old days, um, people from the old world, like me and others, um, and from the ancient days, and the people who are practicing the occult of this very day, candles would be put on top of the trees, among other things, because it was the dark times. You know, this was a season of the year in which the, um, most of the sun was gone and it was constantly dark out. Well, candles were lit that was actually used as a beacon to the winter god so that during the evenings he would see those lights fly over and come around your house and bless the people inside of the house in your home for walking him back in. This is why the candles were used, and to this very day, we're still using these seasonal lights. We're, you know, we've got electric lights, so we've modernized the practice of welcoming back the stag god. We put them around the tree, we'll put them in the windows, and we have these massive displays outside, in which these lights, according to the ancient occult practice now, is supposed to welcome back onto the earth the winter god. Now, part of the practice of Christmas is hanging, it, well, I should say, first of all, is the Yule log fire. Now, this, you know, the log inside of it is referred to as the Yule log. Now, it's not called Yule for no reason at all. Remember, this is December 21st, the human night sacrifice of Yule. Now, tradition teaches us in the occult no longer me, because I'm a born again Christian, God be praised. But tradition in the occult teaches that, um, first of all, the Yule log should be made out of birch. Once um, it has been lit and used for um, the holidays, you're supposed to keep one part of the birch log or the Yule log and set it aside for next year. Why you do this is because you're supposed to take that piece of the Yule log from last year in like this year's Yule log. This way, it's a constant cycle. You take from the old, give to the new, the new keeps rekindling um, itself over and over again. This, symbolically speaking, is the cycle of reincarnation because every year you welcome back into your home by lighting the Yule log the god of the winter known as the stag god or originally known as Nimrod. Now, what could possibly be so ungodly about kissing underneath the mistletoe? Well, there's a couple things wrong with this, first of all. One thing I will warn you about, people, whatever you do, never touch those berries. Three of them could kill you. This plant is so poisonous. Um, among other things that's wrong with it, Mistletoe itself was very sacred to the Druids. Um, it was a fertility plant. This was a very sacred plant 
to the Druids, from which the Illuminati claim direct ascendancy from. They claim to be the modern day Druids, or the modern day rendition of the Druids. And it's because this is a fertility plant that people kiss underneath it. Now, with the mistletoe, we have another fertility plant known as the wreath. You know, we make a Christmas wreath. It's green and red, and you will find, constantly find green and red throughout the Christmas season because in the occult world, those are the two colors that I use for this season. And for every season, they do have specific colors that's used for their occult magic and occult belief system. Now, the wreath itself is always circular if they're an occult practitioner, and there will always be candles in the center of it. The reason this is so, as I said before, this is another fertility symbol. The candle or candles represent the male phallic symbol. The circle represents the female reprodu reproductive organs. This is why it is a um, symbolically speaking, a fertility symbol. And this is something, symbolically speaking, we have a circle here, man of the beats, that represents reincarnation. In other words, the life, the birth, and the death of the stag god <clears throat> every single year. And you will find that this symbol originated from the great obelisk in Egypt. Now here is a picture of the Vatican City. You'll notice dead center is the obelisk. This obelisk here, at the very top of it, in that bowl supposedly resides the um, charred remains, um, the cremated ashes of Julius Caesar. But notice dead center is the, Chris well, to the side is the Christmas tree. Now, the obelisk itself, and let me explain this to you. Notice how the obelisk is here and there's a circle around it. This is a very ancient, occult, pagan symbol of fertility. Now, you will notice that there are sets of lines, two here, two here, and all the way around. Now, the reason the obelisk was designed in such a fashion was because it's really, in actuality, a giant heliocentric sundial. The shadow of this obelisk, and all obelisks wherever they are throughout the world, is going to fall in a certain place depending on the position of the sun. Now, if the obelisk shadow falls within any of these two lines, it is another night of human sacrifice. That's why there is eight sets of them, because the shadow will fall in between these sets throughout the year. And of course, as I said before, notice, you know, the um, Vatican Church is going to make sure they have their pagan Christmas tree right here in, um, in St. Peter's um, Square. And other examples of the obelisk we have here is one in um, Central Park in, um, in New York. This would be Cleopatra's Needle. Supposedly, this is one of the three um, needles that resided in Heliopolis when um, they were um, just dragged from Egypt and brought here to America. This one here. Well, we've already gone over this one in the first DVD. This particular one was man-made, just like the others, but this one was made here in Washington, D.C. This is, of course, the Washington Monument. 555 feet above ground, 111 feet below ground, making for the total height of this occult pagan symbol 666 feet exactly. And if you notice, like the other ones, here we have the male um, phallic symbol and there is a circle all the way around it, which represents the female reproductive organs. This is nothing but the ancient occult fertility symbol of Semiramis and Nimrod just brought to the modern day through the, orga through the organization of the Illuminati. Now, of course, we have 
another fertility, another fertility symbol here. This one is the holly. These are holly berries. And again, this is um, another sacred plant in the Illuminati. They still worship this as one of the more sacred plants. It's another fertility symbol. As I said before, these are the holly berries. And of course, there is, from the old country, the person known as the Holly King. Okay? It's from the Holly King, the whole story is behind the Holly King and such, where eventually another person comes into play. From the Holly King, you get who's known as Santa Claus. Now, Santa Claus is an interesting study because, you know, through Santa Claus, the Illuminati has tried to prove that they are like gods on the earth, through the myth. Now, when we go through the story of Santa Claus, Santa Claus is actually supposed to be all-knowing. I mean, think about this. Doesn't Santa Claus know who's been good and who's been nice every single day of the year? That's one of Santa Claus's ability. He, he knows exactly who's been good and who's been nice, and he knows um, how this has worked for each, of in, each individual throughout the year. Well, Santa Claus has the ability of being omnipresent, or just about, because on the night of Christmas, is he not able to traverse the entire world and literally just about be everywhere at the same time and drop off who knows how many billions of presents. Well, at least that's what the story tells us. And Santa Claus, his sleigh, if you notice, is pulled by eight reindeers. Now these are um, commonly known as stags. This is why, if you notice very quickly people, Santa Claus is just another representation of the stag god. And it's for eight reindeers, eight for no reason at all. You see, eight is the only number that if you put it on its side, becomes an occult symbol, which is the number for infinity. Or the act of reincarnation throughout the year. In this case, Santa Claus. Now, here we have one of the ancient depictations of the stag god. It's one of the few um, bronze reliefs that we still have. You notice he has the horns as a stag, and um, he has this bracelet here, and other things that denote him as the stag god. Santa's little helpers, and this is what really kills me, you know, Rather than own up to the truth, what we've done here in America, well, we've given them a cute little look, you know. Well, these are just little helpers dressed in green and red, and they help Santa throughout the year, you know, making toys and what me not. But you see, the traditions of most of, of America, of most of the holidays, come from Europe. And the true um, elves, and, um, of Christmas were very horrible, evil little creatures. They went around and caused mischief for everyone or anyone who came across them. And the problem is, um, these elves have now, um, ever since the 40s and up to this day because of J.R.R. Tolkien, have now, called, have now become tall, slender, beautiful looking beings with great power and all this they've been transformed um, as a result of that. But the truth of the matter is, the ancient um, traditions and pictures do not lie. They point out to us that the traditional elves were nothing but small, demonic, imp-like creatures who caused anyone trouble who came across their paths. And there's a, a very interesting elf um, that you'll find in Scotland. It's, um, it's, it's around Argyll. This is a giant wooden elf. And if you notice, it is anything but a Q 
cutesy little warm fuzzy little creature. This is a horrible evil looking creature and that's what they were all about. Elves, you know, only became, you know, cutesy once we decided to try to dress up the occult practice of Yule and call it Christmas and make it something palatable. And as I stated before, well, of course, over the Christmas fire, you know, the Yule time, the Yule log fire, well, we hand Christmas stockings. Stockings have, you know, according to the ancient um, practices, is where presents were left, not for the person to get, but they were supposed to leave presents there for the Yule God, for the stag God to take. But we perversed it, and supposedly now, those are there for our benefits. People put small gifts and items in them, um, and if Santa Claus determines you're bad, you get, you know, charcoal put in them instead, you know? Now, all this is where, from the occult world, the modern day practice of Christmas has come from. But the question that we need to ask is, is this the birthday of Christ? Was Christ born on December 25th? And if not, whose birthday is it? Now, when we turn to the book of Luke, we're going to get a major clue as to what, um, as to whether or not Christ was born on the 25th of December, let alone during the season. According to Luke chapter 2, in, it goes from verse 1 to verse 5, it says, And it came to pass in those days that w there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made from Cyrenius, was governor, was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Okay? So, we have a biblical marker right there. There was, historically speaking, and we can prove this, um, a, um, a taxation from Caesar Augustus. Now, according to the ancient records, this um, taxation happened during the month of September. Now let's just keep that in mind as we go along. Um, picking it up, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, and this is very important, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, there are shepherds out in the field right now, and they're watching over the flock. I have spoken to many Jewish friends of mine and to rabbis I've known about this passage. My friends who have lived on kibbutzes have told me that the sheep that shepherds watch over in the, over in the fields around that part of Judea and such, um, the sheep are never brought out of the field until the end of September or, and they say, usually no later than the second week of October because it gets too cold out there for the sheep to, um, to survive in. So it's around that time of the year that they will bring the, she the sheep in. And the rabbis have told me the sim a similar story. They all say right around that same time. So, two things we can conclude so far, safely as far as I can see it. The, the timing of the taxation, and according to people who live there in Judea to this very day and in the past, who have spoken to me and who have been eyewitnesses, says that's the time of the year when they bring the sheep in. It's not after October or, you know, the middle. It's not after that. It's before it, and usually that is somewhere around the end of September or around the beginning to the mid part of October. So we know that that's when the timing of the shepherds had to have been, right around that time. Now, we find out another interesting thing in the Bible. We have to pick this up, going back to Matthew chapter 2, and we started in verse 1. And 
And this is going to be a bit of a lengthy one, but just bear with me. This has a lot of important information for us. Now when, Jesus, now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may also come and worship him. When they had heard of the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. We'll just stop it there. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary. Guess what? They did not find him in the manger. You know, according to ridiculous traditional beliefs, Christ was um, visited by everyone in the manger. Now this, um, a friend of mine took this photo for me, Lynn Shalesky. This is quite a manger scene. You know, we have um, three wise men. Now according to Catholic teaching, that's Gaspar, Belthazar, and Melchior. Um, we have an angel there, uh, we have a shepherd there, camels, we have a donkey, and a couple of sheep. And most of those people weren't there. You see, the Bible tells us that when Christ was born, Mary and Joseph was put out in the manger because there was no room for them in the stalls. And according to what we just read right now, it says about the wise men, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. You see, they never made it to the manger. They never did. You see, this is two years later after Christ was born. Go into the Bible. It makes it very, very clear that, first of all, these wise men, when Christ was being born, they saw the great star of the east. They weren't there in Judea when they saw it. These people are from the Far East. They had to literally cross from one end of the continent all the way across and then down into the land of Judea to where they could finally make it. And this took approximately two years, ladies and gentlemen, because they didn't have automobiles or planes or trains. They took camels. And they formed a giant caravan and this caravan literally had to have been humongous because you see in that in those days and age um, um, Judea and the outer provinces was not the place to visit because um, they had a lot of sordid people there it was just not a user-friendly place to put it politely so the wise men and it was more than three because they had to pull their resources together first of all and get permission from whatever um, potentate they, um, um, they were under authority and they had to leave and make that two year crossing with a huge army by their side so that they would be protected. Now, they would go to the region. They had, remember, golds of gift, of, um, gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And when they got to Christ, it was two years later and then they presented him with the gifts. 
and it is two years because if you recall in further on in the Bible, it said that Herod was so upset that um, he could not find out from the wise men where the baby Jesus was because he didn't want to worship him. He wanted to murder him. So, once the wise men had told him um, what had happened, he knew that Christ was two years old at this, at this point, which is why he told his soldiers to go out into Jerusalem and kill all the two-year-old um, male children. From two and under, they were all supposed to be butchered. That's why it was two years old, because of the timing. This is what was going on. Christ was two years old at, the, at this time. The wise men had informed Herod how long it took them to get from one end of the continent to where they were now. And so all he had to do from that point was just tell the soldiers, kill all the male children to and under. So the question then becomes, if it wasn't the Lord's birthday, whose birthday was it? If you recall, back in our first DVD of this series, we found out that Semiramis and Nimrod had a child known as Tammuz. And Tammuz was supposed to be the reincarnation of Nimrod because he had been killed. Now, Tammuz's birthday, in, according to the ancient um, records and everything, Tammuz was born on December 25th. Now, according to occult practice, remember, Yule is the night of, the tw of December 21st. It's the longest um, winter night um, for the year. And it is on um, this day that a night of human sacrifice occurs. What had happened? In order to marry this new movement of Catholicism into um, paganism, they took December 21st, moved it up to December 25th, the birthday of Tammuz. There was also a major Roman festival at that time on December 25th known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a big festival in which, you know, there would be these huge parades of people um, going through the cities and to the heart of Rome. They would be dressed in their finest outfits and they would be bringing offerings and gifts and everything. And there'd be, you know, a lot of wine drinking. Um, there'd be ham and birds being served as um, parts of the banquet. And gifts were actually being given to all the people. And there was a lot of wine and merriment. Well, you know what? The same thing goes on to this very day. Aren't we given, you know, these Christmas gift offerings and aren't we, you know, still having the Christmas ham and aren't we giving gifts to one another and don't we still have, you know, these long Christmas parades, you know, I think they're called, um, they're, they're in New York and other places, we have these huge parades. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, Saturnalia is still being practiced to this very day on December 25th, except all we've done is candy coated, we've Christianized it, and we've called it Christmas. You know, when we take a look at this ancient relief, this is whose birthday we're celebrating. This is one of the most ancient and one of the few reliefs we have of the god known as Tammuz. And it really saddens me to think that somehow we've allowed this pagan god to be um, deified and allowed to be um, the god of Christmas. We, instead of um, having absolutely nothing to do with this pagan occult festival, we're actually worshipping the ancient god known as Temuz. I think by now, and I don't think I have to go any further into this, I think it's quite obvious from, just from the biblical perspective alone, that God wants us to have absolutely nothing to do with these occult practices, because they are occult practices. They're nothing that we should be involved in. God said, learn not the way of the heathen. 
And over in Corinthians, he strictly tells us not to go after the traditions of men. Because that's all these are. We find out from the scriptures, um, only Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, and some animals, made it to the manger. The angels, believe it or not, had already made their proclamation to the shepherds that Christ was born, and then they left. They didn't make it to the manger. Um, the wise men never made it to the manger. It took them two years to finally get to um, where the Lord was. And even the Bible says that they finally found Joseph in his mother's house. We should have absolutely nothing to do with any of these occult holidays. And, yeah, it might appear as if I'm being a stick in the mud here. Because, let's face it, these holidays are alluring. I mean, come on, we get presents, you know? And, you know, we sometimes get to choose what presents we want, even though we're not supposed to, you know, but... So it's very alluring because, as I've told people time and time again, there is a beautiful side to evil, and it's a very, very seductive one. It will twist and distort your reasoning and deceive you into believing that these things are indeed Christians, but they are not. Scripture warns us that um, the deceit of the enemy is so strong, it could even deceive us, the elected children of God. So I'm going to leave it up to you, ladies and gentlemen, because let's face it, you are responsible for this knowledge now. It's between you and God, but I would tell you right now, I would get rid of this occult practice as soon as I could, because the longer you allow it to stay in your life, the harder it is for you to get rid of it. And all I can say is right now, um, just think about all the evidence, review it in the Bible, and judge for yourself. Mm -hmm.